aim at the chest, is that the idea? <laughs> Frightening. Uh, I said to Wyatt that uh, I realized it was a convention to thank him and the staff, but I didn't really want to be a polar convention. I said, well, why don't you just wail into us? And I thought, yeah, what a great idea. So Wani, it's so far away from anywhere that's civilized that the most exciting thing in the world is we got a new CVS 10 miles away. <laughs> but then I thought, well, no. I'm extraordinarily grateful for everything that Suwani has done for me, and the staff is extraordinary. But it is far away, isn't it? <laughs> and everything comes to a halt for Moth Walk. <laughs> it's lovely. I want to do one unconventional thing. Um, because I don't think that my uh, uh, lecture title was announced, the lecture on Friday will be titled Elizabeth Bishop at Summer Camp. And I will promise you uh, unpublished letters, uh, unpublished poems, and photographs. I know. What could be more exciting than that? <laughs> this is an elegy for Donald Justice, my teacher, my colleague, my friend, Cedar Key After Storm. The fish shacks turned an oystery glow, the drowned light more intense. Along the blank sky, low clouds learned from experience. A bridge leapt over the inlet where sawtooth reeds had bedded, like spears and rusting silhouette as the summer storm receded. Carved from gray blocks of wood, enormous sad pelicans on the concrete balustrades stood stiff as librarians, as if they dimly knew the mighty events to come. The distant thunder grew fainter like a brushed kettle drum. And you were a great bird, sickly, fleeing the northern weather. Ten years had passed quickly since we watched the gulf together. Look back now at the theft of boredom and jazz and the rages and see what little is left just a book of the thinnest pages. Your voice was the gentlest whisper. Your health had gone so fast. Of all the things you were, perhaps that would be the last. Gainesville is uh, also a fairly isolated place. It does have an airport. Uh, it, it, it sits in northern Florida just above what Northern Floridians call a prairie, which means a swampy, large tract, large tract of ground that used to be a lake, but now is kind of a watery mess that alligators like. The prairie. The winding road beneath the ancient oaks, edged with palmetto scrub, like nature's little jokes, cut a crooked path to that antique Eden, one that God forgot, a place like Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Swedes. Past the sudsy gray lake where water boiled, the treeless marshy prairie still unspoiled, unfolded to the horizon, a hand-drawn chart with monsters at the corner like a work of art. We lay, we lay beneath the gray-green oaks to rest while blizzards rang their changes further west. Then before us, a red-shouldered hawk dropped like the hand of an invisible clock into dry cracked reeds. The day grew still, as if someone somewhere had grown ill. At last the hawk lifted with something in its claws. Even Dame Nature has unkind laws. And that was all. No one else was there to see or provide the consolation of philosophy. When we turned back, the breeze had shifted. Or was that cloud like an eyebrow lifted? Rembrandt had pupils. We know of a few of them. The greatest genius among the pupils was a man named, a young man named Carol Fabricius who later went to work in Delft, had a studio uh, there. And unfortunately, when he was 32, uh, the studio and that whole quarter of Delft blew up. There was an armory, there was gunpowder, and suddenly there was not a whole quarter of Delft. In fact, if you stand on top of the church tower, you can see that that quarter is significantly different architecturally. It's never changed. And Fabricius lost his life. We have only six or eight or 10 or 12 uh, paintings by him, and, and they're all pretty much all remarkable. The Blessed Redemption of Delft. Rank with the clotted, simmering greens, the sleek canals were overgrown with shade, and then the thought of shade, the painter made his own. The rain was taught by harder rains, as if the heavens disagreed with that distinguished apostolic light, consoling in its need. He loved the century's moral itch, the moral purpose of the, the mortal purpose of the eye revealing what would constitute a civilized reply. Within the burnished, gilded frame, sorry, within the burnished, gilded frame, the oil starts to turn to flesh, as if the burning of long silences let us begin 
afresh. I'll read one more poem from the Naked Ladies book, which was not my choice, but which I acceded to when Penguin suggested that that was the way to get strange flesh into the bookstores. <laughs> this poem is called The Beast in the Jungle. It depends very heavily on James's, Henry James's story, The Beast in the Jungle. Uh, if you don't know it, well, this is uh, a, a version of it, a modernized version of it. I had at one point, briefly, the hope to write a whole series of poems based on James's stories, but it turned out one was enough for James and for me. The Beast in the Jungle. Met a girl at a party, beautiful girl, and I go, hey, we meet like in Rome? And she goes, no way. You were that guy in Naples waiting, waiting for something. So we wait. She's 30, I'm 35. Then she's 60, I'm 65. So she goes, hey, I'm going to die. And I go, no way. And she goes, you see that thing yet, that tiger or whatever? And I go, nope. And she goes, that's what you think. So she dies. And someone else gets all her money. I go away for like a year, see Asia. Then I come back. I go see her grave. And I think like, shit, I should have married her. <laughs> whatever. My pediatrician when I was five years old was uh, a man named Von Trapp. <laughs> Dr. Von Trapp was, I think, the eldest boy in the Von Trapp family, and he was the reason they came to America. They came to send him to med school when they were done with all the European singing and Julie Andrews and all the rest of the stuff. They came to America and settled down and eventually bought a place in uh, Stowe, Vermont, where the Von Trapp family, the descendants, still live. But uh, my Dr. Von Trapp, uh, practiced in Little Compton, Rhode Island, which was just across the border from my childhood home in Westport Point, Massachusetts. Little Compton. Young Dr. Von Trapp, one of the singing Von Trapps, aimed at my knee with the reflex hammer, its rubber head a pink triangle of gum. The leg leapt forward on its own. They also called it a tomahawk hammer. I uh, found his daughter online, now in her 70s, I think wrote her that I remembered fondly, those reflex sessions with Dr. Von Trapp. <laughs> the Kiss. The epigraph is from uh, the great Stephen Hawking, uh, who said, when I hear of Schrodinger's cat, I reach for my pistol. <laughs> Which is a pretty witty thing for a, for a physicist to say, really. <laughs> Moody, black-haired, she was a whole philosophy, just another girl, perhaps, but not to me. When she kissed me roughly, on the lips as if I had been staggered by two battleships, I lay exhausted on the cooling sand. Life, life seemed only a conjunction, and or or, perhaps, or yet or but. I touched my mouth, bleeding from an invisible cup. And that was all. One kiss by the glaring bay, sometimes love happens that way. A few nights later, this local goddess turned and said carelessly, in a way that burned, I don't think of you that way, I guess. She touched me then with the ghost of a caress. Now, when we happen to meet, a wall of glass rises between us on the street or in the bar where we've gone for a drink, she grabbing in her purse the night again like ink. Some know who they are by what is missing. Perhaps there's a world where we kept kissing, where we married, had three kids, and did what decency now forbids. Nothing terrible happened. No one was swept away, and our lives continued almost the same way. Leaf color. A steely, torn silver rusted along the edges, the faint acidic yellow like the backwash of a polluted pond. Earth spatter and gold spot in blotchy shallows grazed the purpling of drenched slate, and a pooling, crimson, a pooling crimson with the false bonhomie of the maraschino cherry, all that unnecessary light turning to tinder. The shadows were fragile fertile, beyond the shocks of grimy hay in a spent field, the India ink closeted blacks. Why choose the easeful darks? Not that anything lay hidden there. Was it only the spilled over abandoned life and from the wastage, the broken buds? Thoreau. That oily bale of rags lost to the silent architectures of the wood, or so it seemed as the falls chancels darkened and rough earth gave and forgave. Forgave, I mean, the intrusion. One of
one of the things that you say in workshop a lot is that the poem's too long. And uh, over the years, when I've directed students' theses, I've often, more, th more often than not, cut a poem so that it ended up in the thesis as two lines. Never one, but two. I tell my students that there are a lot of editors who would love to see a poem that was 10 lines or less because it's different from the 15 to 35 line poems of which magazines are composed. After Eden. Before us lay mud-bestrewn banks, the flats rutted and torn as if cast from molds already broken. The Lazarus ridges were picked out in pine, the sun those silent hours barely rising above the eastern mountains. I had imagined something different. Those days I thought about the future. You looked older, the hard lines scoured into your face. Long afternoons upon the piazza, we sipped some Venetian variant of coffee, the richer for being thick with the sediment of Byzantium, the arsenal empty of keels, the mazy canals mossy with trash. We were young then. So there we waited, having made a small mistake involving the fruit or the fruit salad, condemned to the view, if it could be called a view, of hills bare as a scalp, nothing upon their nakedness but some platonic idea of vacancy. This is heaven, we said. Someday you should get a look at hell. <laughs> Long Island, summer 1968. Mary Jo gave me a fit with that poem last night about the draft lottery, because I remember it was, I was there. And, and uh, I looked it up last night, because of course you can look up these things with Google, and I was 107 that year. Uh, and my recollection is that the numbers went to 95. The web seemed to disagree. The selective service system seemed to disagree. I mean, it said it went to 195, but I know I was never classified 1A, and I certainly was not called. But I know I was nervous for the next six or eight months. And when she brought it up, it was like, you know, one of these nightmares you've managed to forget about, but. <laughs> Summer 1968. Beneath that chalk blue sky with iron stirred through it, the pale whitewashed windows burned in faint phosphorescence. That long forgotten summer amid the ghostly Long Island yachts, we entered the waters on that narrow neck beneath the cracked porcelain moon. Our blank lives had almost begun. War rose behind the shuttered summer that summer. We whispered beneath the low masses of anchored boats, stirring through that coldness, the phosphor radiant along bodies naked in their nakedness. There in the iced waters, our glowing outlines almost made us whole. I think Dan O'Brien and I are gonna collaborate on a TV show. Dan, this is the pitch. It's called The Truth Dog. Among ugly dogs, he had few peers. His one eye possessed an evil glint, so say the authorities, though some who knew him claim never to have noticed. Others deny that the animal had special powers, though from an early age he was known as the truth dog, the dog who could detect any lie, from the merest white slip of a white to the blackest secret ever held. You had to hold him to get the full effect, but even petting him could be enough. When a man with a man who lied every day of his life, the dog simply bit and bit hard. But mostly you had to tell the lie to get a reaction. Then the dog would growl deep in his throat. If you told the, to if you told the lie again, he would bark twice sharply. Once a lie was so awful, he leapt from the boy's arms and was not seen for two weeks. Many wanted him put to sleep. Even an owner or two, he never lasted long in any house. The wife or husband always had a few secrets, and the dog plainly didn't like secrets. One preacher tried to poison him, and an actress of impeccable character tried to run him down with a car. <laughs> Those who offered to buy him included a criminal or two and a fat producer who tried to make him the star of reality television. The sitcom lasted only two seasons and starred Charlie Sheen. <laughs> the dog put up with all the fuss for the sake of an occasional beef bone and a blue rubber ball he was fond of. One day, he simply disappeared. Some say the mafia kidnapped him, others that the CIA wanted to train dolphins to do what the poor dog did artlessly and with perfect accuracy, so far as anyone knows. There remain those who believe he was found, almost by accident, by a girl who, though guilty of her share of bad things, simply did not know how to lie. <laughs> For the missing. 
there's a epigraph of people who are still missing. That hazy, faintly discernible glow, already half erased, lodged in the corners of the night like a silver bowl delicately chased. That was 40 years ago. When I see you now, I don't remember us kissing. I remember your hard words and black bra and other things that were missing. The setting of this next poem is um, a Christmas tree lot in uh, southern Massachusetts, possibly Rhode Island, circa 1955, 1956. It's called Christmas Trees. How should I now recall the icy lace of the pain like a sheet of cellophane or the skies of alcohol poured over the salt box town? On that stony New England tableau, the halo of falling snow glared like a waxy crown. Through blue frozen lots, my giant parents strolled, wrapped tight against the cold like woolen argonauts, searching for that tall perfection of scotch pine from the hundreds laid in line like the dead at Guadalcanal. The clabbered village aglow that starry, stark December, I barely now remember, or the brutish ache of snow burning my face like quicklime. Yet one thing was still missing. I saw my parents kissing, perhaps for the last time. Winter of falling temperature. Frost settled on the vines like powdered sugar. The city took its time. What was dawn but a crosshatch of old scenes until scarred new? Crystals furred the glass like lichen, leached into the new forest's albino flowers. Mirrors of ice lay shattered along gutters. Spring fell narrowly ahead, some worn out land with outspread harbors and waving beauties. What was the punishment Dante reserved for traitors? Only the frigid air. Bitterness seeped through our bedroom walls, not silvery like passion, but like a child who never intended to be born. Fall in the sketch pad. The, there's an epigraph from Moby Dick. Uh, that mortal man should feed upon the creature that feeds his lamp and eat him by his own light, as you may say. This seems so outlandish a thing. The gray damage hung over the roof tiles, that late light passing for annunciation. They were almost our fathers, the headless statues lagged in their rows down the dead garden. Then the street lamps died, as if, it soon, as if soon it would be dawn. A scatter of pink petals dampened the walk, the petals too like your flesh, that shocking warmth beneath. The pheasant in his empires. The laser of English sunlight etches the yellow rape. R rape is a plant. I should have said that before. Etches the yellow rape, heeding the stranger's eye to thoughts of mild escape, to lonely uncanny moors, the cankered rows of blakes, benighted chalk-cliffed coasts, or empty bejeweled lakes. This steamy summer vision, bleached in indolence, admits a single intruder perched on a wire fence. Its drenched Tyrrhenian purples, spit-shined tawny browns, sharpened glints of silver, trouble the pockmarked downs that barred the armored legions breasting the swampy marches until the border succumbed to a study of Roman arches. So civilization was dragged out of the sunstruck south, the pin-straight road led plumbing, a bird fit for Caesar's mouth. And after the fall of Rome, belonging in their way, to a place they had once invaded, the invaders managed to stay. That poem used to be longer, and then when I was reading it last night to myself, I said, oh yes, as usual, it stops at the end of the first page and just throw the rest away. Deborah Gregor taught me that. <laughs> Years ago, when I was first making a trip around Europe uh, on a rail pass and uh, not a lot of money, when you, could, when, you could, when you could get a B&B a &B room in the middle of London for a pound and a half a night, uh, I met a lovely woman in Florence, and uh, I thought I took down her address. I wrote her a poem a couple of years ago and then went into the attic to look for the address, but didn't seem to be there anymore. I must have been mistaken. 
so I couldn't send her the phone. Not that she was likely to live in the same place 35 years later or more. The back of a girl in Florence. Uh, uh, this is obviously indebted to uh, Philip Larkin, and I use as an epigraph, nothing like something happens anywhere. Amsterdam, London, Paris, Basel, Rome. I rode the trains with hippies far from home on their private grand tours, which as a rule ended in Kabul, Kathmandu, or graduate school. I passed the dusty porticos, long closed, a cobbled alley hung with women's clothes. Venus de Milo, Nike of Samothrace, those haunted galleries, each with its haunted face. On a rapido, through the Campagna, stalled for hours beside a field of homely saffron flowers, I came to no great decision about my life, had no epileptic idea, did not meet my future wife, and later suffered no epiphanies beside the Parthenon, no geologic insight reading Chesterton. One evening in Florence, though, I walked behind three blonde Americans who talked of the inconsequent nothings of their summer, where everything was cool or far out or such a bummer. <laughs> the tall, pony-legged one, tanned and lithe, marched with the instinct of a harvest scythe, her long back naked between the beneath the evening's haze, arched shoulder blades chiseled by praxitole. What sculpture is more beautiful than a living breast, an interned belly, or hazel eyes that suggest hopes new rendered, then forever lost. We were young, of course, and that was the cost. Had I approached, what would she have had to say, that girl whose loveliness would soon decay? I kept silent rather than take the risk. Oh, my Manet, my walking odalisque. On the banks of the Allegheny, my father was an executive for various firms when I was a child, and so we moved around almost as much as, uh, as army brats do. Uh, not quite as often, but I had a number of addresses. We had started over again, an unpainted house with the new Chevy in the drive. The model was the push-button transmission. The lots were new, rich brown like expensive leather. The fresh turds nested in the unseated lawn, shivering with inner life, the maggots squirming wildly toward the light. on the late Latin light. The semi-precious sunset, windswept, vain, took the cold, buttery light and made it work. Myopia blurred the rain, laying the dust. It was elegiac light, L-I-T-E, in other words. The window framed a gallery of garden, wisteria draped along the mossy fence, the lilac punk show of a woodblock print, as if a chisel could engrave a thought. There was an hour when style was not the cause, Jerome in his ink blotch study, lion and skull, props and some fantasy of scholarship, scratched down the words of God in his own tongue. Latin was not the tongue, I forgot to add. He was the odd man out, or in, perhaps. A garret in Paris. If you leaned over the peeling window ledge, one tower of Notre Dame rose over a rusty bridge. The puckered sen labored down to the storm-tossed coast while you sat smiling above the burnt toast. So far as I remember, that was the year of rain, the year of unpaid bills and accidental pain. Yet each morning your face stood mottled in the light, holding back some feeling never allowed to ignite. Somewhere underground, the metro rumbled on. You lifted a dark eyebrow. Something there was gone. And in the air grew the airy sound of wings, like an annunciation, among other things. Many of these poems uh, are dedicated, but I feel that dedications ought to be, in a certain sense, private. However, in this next case, this poem is dedicated to my sweetie. It's a uh, sort of epithalamian, uh, since, as some of you know, Ms. Gregor and I, after 30 how many years, Ms. Gregor? 36 years of, wedded, of unwedded bliss. Got married a year and a half ago. <laughs> Big moment. We got married in Cambridge, England, in the old tubercular hospital with uh, a vast crowd of two witnesses. Uh, and uh, 
or one witness managed to ran over, run over a man's cell phone in the parking lot. It's an exciting day in many ways. Durer's stag beetle. Pincers erupt from its skull case, two damascene blades sharpened for some crusader, its armor plate enameled in black and brown, some alamo tailored jacket just racked by Prada, though the belly resembles my computer mouse. Perhaps you don't know this beautiful, is it a watercolor, Deborah? I think it's a, I think it's a watercolor. It's one of Durer's great watercolors, a stag beetle. Though the belly resembles my computer mouse, its legs, the spindly legs of a Paris dancing master, and in Rorschach blots or sad India ink beads like broken necklaces of Tahitian pearls. Bug, you are a part of your sums, lowly ding an sich in that rude philosophy available only to creatures that crawl. Not even the most patient bride would hold such a pose for more than 500 years. Still, who complains about success in design? O oh, beetle, ever now the hard-headed bachelor of the grass lot realm, never to know the comforts and solicitations of the holy marital state or the elegance promised to those who worship the trinity of abdomen, thorax, head. Bless our belated nuptials, delayed past the date when wisdom could bow to love or grace in its own grave time turn back to stone. To the lady in the back. I'll close with a medium length, long poem, uh, which is a translation of book 13 of the Iliad, but shorter. Uh, <laughs> lest you think it's line for line. Uh, and also heavily indebted to Christopher Logue's translation. Christopher Logue is perhaps the most brilliant and, and wild and mad uh, translator of Homer we have ever had, English has ever had. So this is an homage of, of a kind. Book 13. The Budlia struck its colors, the dawn proving somewhat a disappointment, as so often. Blood stained the sand beside cracked spear shafts, dented kettles, frayed hawsers, the moan of the dying. Hector and his thugs could be seen far off, skirmishing, hurling torches, trying to set the fleet ablaze. A god might have put on his sunglasses, ignoring the insect life that goes on below. Seeing the Trojans come forward like beetles, I felt a curious fascination as if I were rubbernecking at some fender bender. It was not much of a wall, mostly piles of trash and sand the embankment. From its rock perch, a knife-tailed hawk dropped like a stone. The priests called that the descent of a god, which was fine if you followed some filthy Eastern religion. When the Trojans left the thrown together defenses like ballet dancers, the gods were nowhere. The Greeks, well, they fought like Greeks, shields overlapping like fish scales, helmets touching like men in bed together, their ridiculous shakos chopped from horse tails, but against us slouched the leviathan Hector, morbidly obese, as hard to stop as a dump truck. Men battled in pairs, singly, swarming in confusion, like brokers waving their arms on the floor at Wall Street. Tukros caught one of Priam's sons-in-law with a spear point below the ear, just where the carotid fetches into the brain. The blood hosed every man in range. Then a long spear came wheezing through the lines. Two cross ducked, and the harpoon caught Amphimachus below the breastbone. It was that funny. The big man screamed like a girl and dropped stone dead, his armor clanging like chimes. Multiply the scene a hundred times, hell, a thousand. Men cut the heads off fresh corpses, then rolled them through the lines like bowling balls. Our king stole armor from the rotting dead and tossed it in a slave's direction. That was just another way of doing business. On went the Fandango through the afternoon, the afternoons, chariots wheeling, horses hamstrung along the shingle, gutted men beside them, broken up like toys, and the poets back in Greece already thumbing up the right metaphor, say a lion or a mountain boar, not that the poets had seen many lions or mountain boars. Tuned to the lyre, the death of a warrior became the felling of a thick shanked oak. The poets had learned the wisdom of getting their war dispatches secondhand. One after another, the son of so-and-so, some petty king or minor god who once had it off with a big-tittied girl took a spear to the liver, the gut, the throat, any place that promised a fountain of blood. A man cut across the belly watched his own intestines bloom blue as sausages, and another saw his cock nipped off neat as a rosebud. No one dared say, this is weird, it's just like a movie. It was better than special effects. 
If you believe the 11 o'clock news, the gods saw everything, mass as at Mardi Gras. They veiled their favorites when the dancing got thick, casting up mysterious steams of camouflage. I saw a lot of men die, often turgidly squealing for their mothers. I knew more than a few of those boys, and one or two with reputations. But a year later, who could point out exactly where some apple-cheeked myrmidon stopped breathing? His chest sliced open as if by a scaffold, so you could see the pink pleats of his lungs, the purple sturgeon of his liver. No one could remember his last words, or if he whispered any through the blood. I laughed when Menelaus cold-cocked Pisandros with an axe, making his eyes pop out, then made a speech the way soldiers do in poems. The death stretched out on hexameter like a tanned hide. Though mostly in battle, you heard, fuck, 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 fuck. There were other things, Ajax the oak beaning Hector with a rock like Bob Feller, or standing shoulder to shoulder with Ajax the shrub, like a yoke of oxen fighting all comers, shouting witty repartee like comic book superheroes, or the morning the, the arrows came down like ex exclamation points. Even so, the Trojans almost got the best of it. In the end, a few stuck-up heroes received their comeuppance. Hera charged a wristful of gold bangles to Zeus's credit card. But let me tell you how the wind turned Helis's through the shifting leaf. End of part one of the reading. Thank you. <laughs> now, part two, which is very short. I'm going to be joined by my band, the Cumberland Mountain Pickers and Pluckers and Hummers. We will not delay you long. <laughs> Those of you who were, who were here two years ago remember my uh, amazing attempt to channel Johnny Cash with a rewritten version of uh, Folsom Prison Blues. Well, this is a different song. Unlike Claudia, I wrote a new song for We, and I've been twitting her about it for a week. <laughs> this is uh, a Merle Travis song, a uh, wonderful Merle Travis song, uh, 16 tons. Uh, we're not going to do it like Merle. We're going to do a little bit like Tennessee Ernie, uh, who had a great hit with it. And my backup band is going to make me sound better than absolutely awful. Because <laughs> they're brilliant and I'm not. <laughs> Moses said a poet's made out of mud. I know a poet's made of gristle and blood. Gristle and blood and a heart of stone. A pen for sale and some skin and bone. You write 14 lines and what do you get? Another sonnet deeper than the national debt. Down at the New Yorker, they hate my soul. A poem burns hotter than a piece of coal. When I was a boy, I wanted to be the answer to a question on the SAT. <laughs> a bastard like Frost and a fascist like Pound. Or just a romantic like Shelley who drowned. You write 14 lines and what do you get? Another sonnet deeper than the national debt. The Poetry Foundation hates my soul. A poem burns hotter than a piece of coal. Once poets didn't need a college degree. Now they sit on panels at AWP. <laughs> I can only get through half a verse and they laugh. <laughs> I took an MFA, then I took two, just to get rejected by the Paris Review. You're right, 14 times. <laughs> what do you get? Another sonnet deeper than the national debt. The NEA says they hate my soul. A poem's got to burn till it's out of control. Now, 
Poetry is business, so they say. I'm looking for a job at the MLA. A book from Knopf, then by hell. A Guggenheim, a Pulitzer, and the Nobel. You write 14 <laughs> lines, and what do you get? Another son of deeper than the national debt. The boys at the New Yorker hate my soul. A poem burns hotter than a piece of coal. A poem burns hotter than a piece of coal. A poem burns hotter than a piece of coal.